He loves me. He loves me now. A young girl in a film sits cross-legged in a meadow, hugging petals with a gentle melancholy, waiting for one to tell her the future of a love beyond her capacity. When I was six, I learned that little girls play these games, and there's a 50-50 chance that you will find yourself in love. He loves me. He loves me now. The love lottery actually extends beyond the daisy oracle, which is traditionally used to predict whether a girl will be with the man of her dreams. The love lottery extends beyond the romances of a girl and her suitors, the heart and her desires. By most counts, I look like a woman. I've got childbearing hips and full chest. I spend copious amounts of money on bras. I bleed so profusely once a month that I wish I was somewhere else. And I obey wildly violent mood swings that make other people wish they were somewhere else. I have filled each curve of this body as it's been prescribed to me. I played the game of a pretty womanhood that all the girls would want. It's like a hero's origin story. When did the girl become a woman? The womanhood that I made was characterized by plucking flowers in the aisle, waiting to fill each curve of an hourglass, each slope of a cheekbone, each dash of sensuality tucked into the edges of a collarbone, waiting for blood to spill between your knees because that is when you're a woman, when you are set of curved bones with a warm and waiting bloom. Girls wait anxiously for their first periods. I, Victoria's Secret, like the promise of future fulfillment. So when does the girl become a woman? In the sixth grade of her. I remember this very well. I was 11 years old, I was in sixth grade, it was my first year in the locker room. I tell myself now that middle school is when I became a woman because I got my first period in sixth grade and in sixth grade, I was also already spilling out of the brims of training bras and A cups into the full chest I had by the end of the game. It was sixth grade, my first year in a locker room. My training bra slipped down past my growing chest, leaving half of me exposed to the other girls in the room. And I remember it because it never would have happened to the other girls that were in that locker room. The other girls in the locker room were tall and lean and thin and flat chested, and I was already growing into curves and cutouts, wide hips and thick thighs, breasts too big for my five foot frame. I remember that moment because the girls in the locker room commented on their own flat chests and asked me where I got mine. I remember that moment because it's one of the first times that I felt alone in my womanhood. It's one of the first times I felt like she loved me not. Now, the image I had of womanhood was limited to my copy of The Care and Keeping of You that I kept under my bookshelf. So it wasn't all that, all that great. And I see you two back there know what I'm talking about. Um, so I was what they call an early bloomer, which basically means that I wasn't given a definition of womanhood until I was already expected to have embraced my own, until years after the doctor said I had the body that was considered mature enough to be a woman. So when I was learning womanhood, I had to teach myself. I guessed at my own bra sizes all throughout middle school because I was too embarrassed to get it fitting. And then when I hit high school and finally got size, I found out I was wearing a bra that was two cup sizes too small for me. I practiced the angle that a tampon is supposed to finish your body. And then I cried the first time I had to put one in until my mom coached me from outside the door. My experiences with womanhood were never the prettiest, from the teasing to the insecurities to the blood stains that I left in so many pairs of underwear, but they were unique because I got the chance to make them my own. My newfound womanhood was like a fortress, and I steeled myself to the other girls around me because I didn't feel like those little girls could relate to me. I felt like their teasing was an embodiment of the jealousy they felt of my newfound maturity, of my own womanhood, that they still had to wait for. And as sad as it was that I isolated myself from all these other women, it was something that I was proud of. I was proud to be a woman, and I was proud of the womanhood that I had found. And I was proud because that was what I wanted. It wasn't perfect, but it looked the way I wanted it to look. And that was the first time when I felt like womanhood could still love me. I was proud of my womanhood until I found out I wasn't supposed to be. I was 16. I was in a doctor's office at the hospital. I drank two glasses of water before I came so that my stomach was bloated, just like they asked to do. And then it wasn't enough water, so I sat in the waiting room for another 20 minutes drinking more um, until they decided that there was enough meat for them to stab. Then I went to the office, they smeared goo on my stomach, and then poked me with a stick for 15 minutes. 
I was getting an ultrasound, but it's not because anybody thought I was pregnant. They were testing if I was sick, if my early blooming was a symptom of an illness rather than the blessing that I thought it had been. And sure enough, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is characterized by the physical imbalance of male and female reproductive hormones, so testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. Um, and for the one in 10 women that PCOS affects, it is a complete toss-up of what that means. Acne, heavy periods, excess body hair, uh, infertility, there are a lot of things that can happen. And these symptoms are very easily disguised as young girls become women, um, easily misdiagnosed as melodrama or normal or as being an early boomer. But I know that the young girls in middle school who saw me and teased me, they would never want to be that girl. They would never want to be told that they seem like a man. They would never want to wonder if they could have kids. They would never want to bleed through girl crowds in a day. And it's exhausting because when you think about it like that, it makes you feel like you're not a woman. It makes you feel like they love you not. These are the benchmarks for becoming a woman. One, you sweat and you grow body hair. Two, you grow breasts. Three, you get your period. And four, congratulations, you're a woman. They're all physical. I was a woman in sixth grade because I checked all of the boxes for what a woman was supposed to be. But those changes didn't mean anything. I was in sixth grade. I knew that my body was changing, but I didn't know that there were prescribed meanings for what I was supposed to assign those changes. And I didn't know that I needed to make certain meanings for them, so I made my own. I didn't embrace the sexuality of a magazine model, or the promiscuity of a romance hero, or the loving nature of a soon-to-be mother. Instead, I isolated myself because I thought that womanhood was a prize to be won. And it's not. See, the failure of the metaphor of blooming comes when you consider the end of a flower's life cycle. When a flower blooms, when a young woman becomes disillusioned with her own womanhood because the meaning that she carved for it was not the meaning that she was supposed to find. My age of impurity started at 16. When I was 16, all of the normal girls around me were becoming women, and I could see the joy bursting from their seams just like I once had, but I didn't feel it myself anymore. Because by the time I was 16, I wasn't a bloomer anymore. I was wilting. I was tired of being a woman because my womanhood felt like a burden. I bleed a lot and I cry too much. And those things aren't just because of my PCOS. Those things are also because I was taught that there's one way to be a woman. There's one version of womanhood that's acceptable. When you get your period at 14, when you grow past the seams of your clothes in high school, when your heart beats in sync with every other woman's heartbeat in the world to fill the perfect outline created by the girl who sat in the, in the meadow plucking flowers. We train ourselves to intertwine physicality and womanhood, womanhood and body. And while that's certainly scientifically based, it becomes difficult because my own womanhood became my animosity. Not because I didn't love it, because I did, but because I didn't love it the way I was supposed to love it. It becomes difficult because the womanhood that is created for us is a womanhood based around certain traits of physical nature. Tradition says that some things make you a woman, having curves, having your period. These are the things that make you into a woman, but society and the world's definition of womanhood leaves no room for error, no room to love your body beyond the norm, no room to be an early bloomer without risk of wilting early too. Womanhood is hard. <laughs> And I lost the genetic lottery. I had all the right curves, but I had all the wrong hormones. And as a result, I couldn't love myself as a woman because I didn't think I deserved to be one. It was hard because it felt like I was just plucking it away at a battle. I never sat in that and did this. I'm not a movie heroine. But I did sit on the floor of the sixth grade locker room, plucking away one petal at a time because I knew that my time had come. That day in the locker room, when my bra slipped down past one of my breasts, I knew that it was time for me to become a woman. And ever since then, the part of me that has felt like a woman has been locked there. No matter how many meanings I come up with for my womanhood, they'll never be right, because they're not the meaning that I was supposed to me. Because you're not supposed to be a woman in sixth grade. You're supposed to be a child. It doesn't matter how many reasons I come up with to love my womanhood. No matter what, 
I will be asked where I came up with those reasons because they're not in the tradition syllabus. And that's why it's so dangerous to use womanhood as a weapon, because it's not perfect, but we think that it should be. Thank you.